Coming to you live from downtown Detroit, this is Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep with your host, Joel Conan. This is a volatile puppy here, isn't it? And Dennis Dick. I've bitten a penny. I will buy the stock for a penny. With everything you need to start your trading day. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this Wednesday edition of Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. Spencer Israel, Joel Conan, Dennis Dick. A lot going on today. Obviously, it's earnings season. Netflix is in focus. IBM is in focus. J&J is in focus. But we have to talk about Tesla and uh, and space, SPCE, continuing to blast off here. After hours yesterday, pre-market this morning, we'll talk about those two stocks specifically. Uh, in addition to that, and the earnings. Uh, our guest today is Jerry Parker. He is the chairman and CEO of Chesapeake Capital. He's one of the famed turtle traders. So we'll talk to Jerry at 835. We'll also talk about a change to the uh, closing auction process, a slight change that the SEC uh, announced yesterday and what that means for your four o'clock uh, trades. Uh, Joel, what's the word here overnight? Green on the screen. What a bear trap on yesterday's close. Close near the lows of the uh, session. Your close was 1950. You take 19 and a quarter in the uh, off the 6 p.m. open straight up to 3650. That's your first target on the upside. Nothing else after that, maybe 3350 on the upside. That'd be a nice juicy target. Crude in the red by 51 cents at 5787. Gold down 210 at 1555.80. Silver just went red by three tenths of a cent at 17.805. And Bitcoin hanging out just under 9,000. The futures down $65 at $8,685. Triple D, how are you doing on this? Well, it's a Wednesday morning, right? Because we uh, we had the uh, the day off for Monday. How you doing? What kind of snack? It's, did you it's get a for synthetic Natalie? Wednesday. So, no, it's a real Wednesday. Oh, it's a real Wednesday. Okay. <laughs> not doing much. I tried to play the Beyond Squeeze a little bit. I've realized I'm not very good at playing these kind of stocks. So I thought with Tesla was trading up substantially last night. I thought the Tesla squeeze was going to continue. I was like, well, they'll continue the Beyond Meat squeeze too. So I bought some last night, some Beyond Meat, and it's trading down. So I've actually already sold it. So I shook out of it. So I'm not a very good Beyond Meat trader. Okay. Uh, well, I thought uh, it would squeeze today. I thought it would be up today with Tesla. I'm surprised it's actually trading down, but there was some news too. So, Spencer, but, yeah. give us the, the reason why Tesla oh. is in the green. Let, let's go to Tesla because yes. this is just unbelievable. This is just, it's going an epic, it's going an epic short squeeze here again. I mean, this is just, just an incredible stock. Uh, and the squeeze has just been one of the best squeezes I think I've ever seen. I mean, and- it just continues. We are getting uh, some follow through uh, this morning. You're getting some analysts having to play catch up. Uh, Wedbush raised their price target to 550 uh, from 370, uh, and I don't. There, there is no real fundamental news for this rally. It's just, it's just a, a rip your face off short squeeze. Well, that's what it is. Um, so, who's raising it here this morning? Uh, Wedbush is coming in, and they're playing catch up as best they can here uh, so now every time an analyst raises their price target we're going to put five percent on the market cap is that how the market's doing this is that no, the math, no, Joel? no no I, I don't think that i don't think that I well that's exactly well i think it because that's exactly <laughs> what is happening here this morning it's up almost five percent here once again so well, yesterday we had a bullish analyst stock takes off 40 bucks Today, we have a bullish analyst. Stock takes up another 25. We have a bearish, you know, underweight to downgrade. The stock hardly falls. Absolutely incredible resilience so, wait, here. So you still think that right now the analysts are, are driving this thing? I don't think so. Oh, I think so. What do you I think? think I think yeah. analysts have a lot to do with that. I think analysts drive it all the time, like just like it was down that day that had the underweight. Yeah, well, maybe so maybe. analysts drive price. They are. More they than are. They got this special. thing by the yes, you know what here. But I, but I don't think they're doing it intentionally. I just mean this is how the market is responding to it. You know, a normal price target raise on a stock is you know sometimes shrugged off. On this, they're looking for any excuse to buy it. So we just need an excuse. Give us an excuse. Okay, we got another. Well, first of all, first of all, first of all so that, wait, 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 stop, stop, stop. I got. Are you both you guys sitting down? Yes. Yeah. 
I have full disclosure here. What, you bought a Tesla now? Lisa asked you to buy a Tesla? Did you buy a Tesla? Lisa bought Tesla. Oh, my God. Oh, oh, oh the t- oh. stock. Oh, yes. God. <laughs> you yeah, bought you- it up here? No, 417. I-, I thought he said she bought the car. Oh, Lisa bought. So, so you've been long Tesla this whole time? Yes. Or, or yeah. Lisa's been long this whole, Le- Tesla yeah, the whole yeah, time? Yeah, yeah, yep, yep. Yep. And oh, wow. the reason is, um, and I, I think I mentioned this to you guys, we, we made one of our biannual trips to the mall and uh, there was a te- at, uh, Somerset and there was a, there was a Tesla store and it was packed. And she said, you know what? She bought a little Apple when we went by the Apple store a few years ago and it was full. And so she bought it. It's and- in the retirement account. Yes. And yep. the retirement. So not trading just retiring well i mean yes. it's been a good buy the whole time up yep i wish i would have been able to hold on i actually had it long a couple times remember and then i wrote puts yep. the put rates was good but i mean the put rates you kid taking some premium and then that story's over i mean you know i was writing puts at 230 you buy the stock you make 300 points write the puts and you know you can make 10 points or 15 points or you know in my case six points because i suck but <laughs> All right, I got a I got a text here from one of my buddies uh, from the gym, and he's he's calling a short term top in Tesla. Everybody is calling a short term <laughs> top, and you know what? This is such a good lesson here in trying to call tops because everybody is trying to call the top in Tesla, and everybody is trying to call the top in this market. They have been trying to call the top in the overall market for a long time. Last night on CNBC Fast Money. Guy Adami basically saying all these reasons why we're going to go down. Uh, Tony Dwyer was on there. He's calling a short-term top. Everybody wants to call the short-term top and be the hero. I will tell you, the majority of these people will not call the short-term top. And this is exactly why Coin Collector is correct, why we are going higher. Because everybody is still in the bear camp saying it has been too much too fast. I heard somebody on CNBC yesterday comparing it to 1999. They obviously weren't trading in 1999 and 2000 because I was. And this is nothing like 1999. Absolutely nothing like it. Do you know? 1999, you had everything trading. Walmart was trading with a P of 70. I mean, you had everything was just nuts in 1999. This is not even 20% of what 1999 was. The valuations aren't even that extreme on the S&P. I mean, what are we trading? 22, 23 times? It's, It's higher. It's on the higher end. But it's not like like 1999 when everything, you know, multiples didn't matter. They actually rewrote, I'm going on a real tangent here, but they actually, you know, I had to add a chapter in the CFA program for how to value stocks that don't make money. And they had a whole chapter because it was so many stocks that were never going to make money. And they were valuing with billion dollar valuations. Well, that all ended. And three years later, they removed that chapter from the CFA curriculum. And I remember my instructor, because I was taking the CFA course back in 2002, and my instructor said, you know how you value companies with zero earnings? And he put a big zero on the board. That was in 2002 when it went the other way, because there obviously is companies that are worth money that don't make money. So, you know, it went in three years, it went from extreme bullish to extreme bearishness. We know the NASDAQ fell from 5,000 to 1,100. It was ugly. This is not 1999, uh, guys and girls. This is not those types of valuations. Yes, we've had an extended. Yes, we are overbought. But it is nothing like 1999. Do you know who said that? Do you know who came on CNBC and said It was one of the big hedge fund managers. Yes. yes. Who was it? Paul Tudor Jones. Paul Tudor Jones. You forget Paul Tudor Jones. (laughs) Because you were definitely trading back in 1999. He was. This is not 1999, Paul Tudor Jones. Woo! It is nothing like it. Maybe, maybe from a hedge fund manager perspective, but I tell you, from a trading perspective, we were we're very active. I mean, we make thousands of trades, you know. And and back in 1999, we were making you know like thousands of trades a week, and you know we're involved, and it was a lot different. Wouldn't you say, Joel? You were trading actively. Yeah, yeah. Does this feel like 1999? Remember, remember a couple guys like we had this uh, Todd. I don't remember his last name. He was in the bright trading trade office. And, and well, we shouldn't give last names anyway. Sorry. You, just you, you asked me what his last name was. <laughs> you just did. <laughs> Anyways, Todd was awesome. He would buy Amazon in the morning and sell it in the afternoon. And he made like 30 points every single day. And I'm like, man, I'm doing something wrong. And this was when Amazon wasn't a thousand dollar stock. Amazon was a hundred dollar stock. And we go to a hundred to 120 and in, in, in a day. Like these stocks were going up 20% in the afternoon on no news. That was a bubble. That was the bubble of all bubbles. You'll probably never get a bubble like that again. 
The tech bubble was just absolutely incredible. Everything. You had a company that had five employees and they had a 7-Eleven store on the corner, but they had, an, they had a website for the 7-Eleven store. It's worth $2 billion. I mean, anything with a website was worth $2 billion. Ask Mark Cuban. Mark Cuban knows. That's how he made all his money. Yep. And he Same sold. Thing. Yep. Yeah. And sold at the top. Mark Cuban genius. Sold at the top. Yep. But yep. that's the way. So when I hear this comparison to 1999, it is nothing like 1999. Uh, well, we got to add, and just, it's great that you're coming on because we have another big hedge fund manager coming on the show. One of the original tutors, Jerry Parker from Chesapeake Capital is going to be joining us at 835. I'm going to throw that statement at him and see what throw he has to say. I'm going to throw it at him. And you know what? I'm going to try and get in touch with Mr. Tudor Jones here and see he wants to come on Benzinga's pre-market prep show. The top Maybe pre- was he referring just to Tesla? I think he was uh, referring to the overall market. He wasn't referring to Tesla. Uh, I, heard, I, I heard the overall market. Let me see. It reminds Tesla me Tesla kind of feels a little bit like 1999. Uh, a little bit. He said the early 1999. Early 99, we had. But he was, and he was talking context of the market there, not Tesla, right? Right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So market feels nothing like 1999. It's overbought a bit. We're due for a pullback. Sure. But this is not sky nosebleed valuations where you're buying things up here. It's going to take you 20 years to get your money back like in the case of Microsoft and every other tech stock that blew up in the year 2000. So I don't think we're at that case. That being said, Tesla is definitely a bubble, but we don't know how high this bubble is going to burst. I mean, it could keep going. And every, everybody that wants to call the top in Tesla has been wrong. The stock it just continues to go higher. I mean, we tried to call the top. I tried to call the top three days ago. So here I am, you know, what is that saying? Calling the kettle black. I mean, I tried it. I thought the little double top of 500, going back to uh, January 8th and January 9th could could work. And I actually tried to short it. You know what I did? I put a stop at 501. So that stock makes a new a new high. I'm getting the hell out. I actually should have put it. I should have went long. But, um, you know, that day I didn't lose the 25 points that it ran after it broke through 500. I lost three points. But I was trying to call a top. Didn't work. Hard to call tops. Uh, people are asking about, like, the earnings, you know. And, I mean... You know, you could have a pre-earnings run. It's impossible to predict the earnings. The earnings could be bad, but the guidance good, you know, in the exact opposite. So you never know how the street is going to react, you know, to the earnings. So if you're if you're sitting on some profits and, you you know, you hit your target, then take it. But I mean, you know, the earnings, I mean, what if they come out and just blow the numbers away and uh, add more cash reserves? Um, I see Tesla the, specifically. Yeah, Tesla specifically. Yeah. I also. When are um, they due? Uh, also, Michigan. I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you asked, Dennis. 29th. A week, a week from today after the close. They're, they're scared going into it. I mean, there's, they could blow it away. And, you know, Kramer was making a point. I like, guess analysts out there that say they think it make 20 bucks a share. I, I saw those estimates. And, you know, there's some analysts at 10 bucks a share. You start making 10 bucks a share, P is 57. It's not that crazy. Nope. Not that crazy. Pre-market high, 579.51. Good volume trading on that back bracket. So if you're looking for a target, if you're looking to use it as a stop, it depends what your risk-reward ratios, that's your pre-market high. We are backed off 8 bucks there. So uh, beyond that, maybe $600. Coming back on the downside, what do you – Man, what do you need to fill the gap from yesterday? I mean, there's probably gaps all over the place in this thing. Uh, in order to get to the top of yesterday's range, and uh, you need to get to 548.58. And I don't know if I had to bet a wooden nickel. I don't know if we're going to see that today. Well, of course, it all depends on the news and the overall markets. But this is not just the Tesla show. We got to cover Netflix here, Dennis. Are you sure? I want to do one more thing on Tesla because Ross sure. Gerber, this is from the pro. Oh, I knew you were going to read this. Yeah, because he's the biggest Tesla bull out there. I mean, Gerber has been, you know, and and obviously long as well. But, you know, he's been, every time it pulls down, you know, he's been the biggest Tesla bull. Besides Jason Rasnick. Jason Rasnick. (laughs) But besides Raz, give me a shout out there, Raz. Gerber has been one of the biggest Tesla bulls out there. And he just said, if this this quote from the pro is correct, the Tesla hits a $100 billion market cap here today. And he says, Gerber says, now the stock is correctly valued. So, Gerber says stock is correctly valued now. So does that mean you're selling Gerber? Are you still holding? What's up? You know, is it overdone? <laughs> Give us more information here, but you're one of the biggest bulls on, and obviously promoters of the stock here on Twitter, at least. Um, 
Is it done? What's up, well, what's up Gerber? We're asking well, you. Here, so, well, so we, meaning Benzinga, not, not me, uh, spoke to him. Uh, oh, nice. And uh, he said, here, I'll just read you a uh, full quote. I think all these firms upgrading Tesla at all-time highs with higher and higher targets is a joke. Uh, where were all these firms seven months ago? So, oh, that's true. Right. Chasing okay. price. Analyst chase price. We have ac- an acronym for it on the show. We call it the a- a- ACP. Analyst I hope no one price. steals. Can we? Should I patent that today? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I don't want anyone stealing that one. We, we, I, I trade around it. I mean, when a stock has a good earnings report, and you know, I've learned this from my buddy Chris, uh, same thing. He's like, stock has a good earnings report. The gap and go works because the analysts come and they start chasing the price for the next two weeks. So now all the analysts sitting there, not that bullish, and all of a sudden, the stock takes off on an earnings report. You know, it's going to be catch up earnings and catch up analyst reports, and the analysts drive the price after them. So, I mean, there's, you know, reasons behind it you know, fundamental reasons that analysts chase price and they push price. And we know that, you know, stocks stay going up for a longer period of time sometimes because the analysts can't stop upgrading. Who, you know, who's the bigger bull? The price target. You know who the biggest bull is? And Who? we've had him on the show here many times. Well, Jason Rasnick. No, a little bit, a little okay, bit who else? more who, who, polished who? than Jason Rasnick. Jason is very polished. Gene okay, uh, anyway. Gene Munster. Yeah, Gene has been for sure. Yeah, yeah, and I think oh, he's an analyst. Not... You know, yeah, yeah, obviously, yeah. Jason runs Benzinga. If you don't know Jason, he's the guy who the, the man behind all of this. Uh, Benzinga, the Tesla, uh, but jumping over man into the obviously with the <laughs> analyst. <laughs> okay, right. uh, let's move on to Netflix here. Um, it was a mostly good report for them. The earnings per share a buck thirty, not comparable to the estimate. Revenue beat five point four seven versus five point four five billion dollars domestic. Pay to subscribers. Uh, that number was light, but the international paid subscribers was so good that it, it, it seemed to overrule that. They added 8.33 million subscribers internationally last quarter versus a seven million dollar estimate, and they only added a little over half a million subscribers in the U.S. So Netflix is doing a good job of of, of convincing us, and and the street seems to be convinced that the story now is not about U.S. growth; it is about global growth. They are continuing to grow internationally, and that is the driver here this morning. Option buyers, we talked oh. about what was it? Twenty five <laughs> points when we priced yes, it yesterday. Yes. Yeah, twenty five points. Wah, so wah, you bought wah. the you bought the calls for thirteen bucks. <laughs> you're down twelve. You bought the puts, or no, if you bought the puts for 12 bucks or 13 bucks, you're down 14. Or you're down your 12, like, and, and 12 theoretical 50, value yeah. anyways. Obviously, they're not going to open there because there's still some time value left on there, but your intrinsic value here Zero. is pretty disappointing. <laughs> and if you bought any options around this, and this is why on the show yesterday, we preached that it, you just can't make money buying options. Well, there's no better poster child example than this Netflix report. The straddle was 25 bucks and the stock moved 76 cents. I mean, yes, we've moved some after hours. Yes, you could have been trading around them a little bit after hours, but you weren't even getting close to getting your 12 bucks, bucks 12 and a half bucks either. Yeah, way. it's crazy. So it's so, so difficult to make money buying options. Not only do you have to call the direction correctly, you need an extreme move in the direction that is correct. And in this case, we don't have really any direction yet. It's been up, it's been down, it's been left, it's been right. And now it's sitting here almost flat. Hard to make money buying options. Uh, you had a spike. Someone got real excited here and took it up to three, 360? Holy mackerel. No, did, I see. Did it get to 360? I didn't see that. No, I said my eyes are a little bad. 352.85. I did see it rally. Yeah. 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 And then you had a, a spike down to 327.45. And here you are at 339. Unchanged. You know, Unch. keep an eye on the clothes, basically. But you know, it's going to go through that uh, several times. You know, if it closes green today, I think, you know, more upside. Kind of looks toppy on the dailies. Uh, you had. Um, that the high of the move at 4538, yeah. and then you had a double double top and a 43 handle, and then two highs at 41 and 4157. So you did you've had a step down seller here over the last four sessions. I mean, this one, if I'd be a little bit more comfortable shortness at uh, you know perhaps at this area with a stop above that and not trying to short the Tesla here. Big uh, rally. I'm not even comfortable trying to short Tesla or okay. Netflix here. Okay. Um, I think you got to let it digest here. I think 
it's going to be a big day for it. If it can start making new highs on the move, then it gets interesting again. Yep. If it can't, you're exactly right, Joel. Then it could peter out here once again, too. It's a very important day. There's a huge battle between the bulls and the bears. You don't get all this after hours movement and then, you know, come back to unch for no reason at all. I mean, it's just people, you got the bull train saying, you know, and I'm not on the bull train, but I've been given the arguments that the competition, at least from Disney, is not very steep. And then you have the others that's saying, hey, no, you know, we're going to get some significant more competition coming in. All this is going to add up to eventually loss of market share for Netflix. I am on the fence. That's why I was like, before I was on the bear train. Now I've been on the neutral train here for about the last month and a half because, like I said, I don't think Disney is a, a threat. So we don't know what the Comcast product is going to look like. We don't really know that much about the Apple product yet. I mean, there's more competition coming, which is never good news. At the same time, they're, you know, they're still the leader here. Let, so. let, let me change that statement a little bit. It has more of an identifiable pattern of a top. There. there yeah that sure like, and right. espe that, especially yeah. if you ignore all this after hours action exactly <laughs> we've been up to 352 it's yes. a, there is no top. tesla doesn't seem to have a top i mean it's just up another 30 points or 25 points this one and just we bring the market to talk back to tesla but it's so incredible i mean we just you know let's just squeeze them for another 26 points there are some people still holding this and i know you know there's people you know say oh they've covered in but we can look at the short interest there are some stubborn shorts out there that have been absolutely crushed in this and they continue to get crushed and they're like well eventually it's going to come back down well the market doesn't have to do anything and it could continue to go up for a while we don't know where the top is in tesla it's definitely an overbought territory but stocks can stay overbought for a long time all right uh adam in the ch in the youtube chat kind of did an interesting strategy here and i think he's talking about um uh netflix he said he sold the put in the call at um at the strike for this week and then he bought the same put and call for next week so basically he's yeah. banking on it not moving but making a move after the report that i don't know taking what you call in that. the premium yeah. yeah and taking in the premium from the event you know which isn't a bad trade there either uh, obviously if the event would have been a blowout it would have been you know what but then he bought that he was protecting himself out further right yeah yeah, yeah. What's that called? Is that called? Is that like is someone can well, help me out on that? He was is, doing a calendar spread. Yeah, but I don't know. I that might be. There might. That's. I don't know. I'm not an options expert. So he but. wrote. Yeah, but you would still have the event premium in the other one too. So and yep. it, it would. So it's not as simple as just saying you're capturing that because the event premium would have been in the next month there too, or in the next week too. So the premiums okay. are there. I guess it's giving you more time, right? Okay, is this the move we've all been waiting for in IBM? No. No. Okay. All right, Spencer. Uh, um, I, I give us I a report. I just don't like IBM at all. They were saying okay. it's called a ghetto spread, Joel. So you should a ghetto <laughs> spread. put that in your in, in your you in your bag. Of uh, <laughs> These are Nick Shaheen questions, by the way. I'm an equities guy. Don't throw the options questions at me. Uh, all right, different I, option spreads. I haven't traded options in ten years. So all right. I don't know. Uh, They've come up with new names for stuff in the last 10 years as well. Since I took options back in university days, back in 1997, there's a lot of fun, different ways of, you know, and different uh, strategies that have evolved from that. But I don't trade options mainly because I've been burned, you know, writing because I, I write the wrong calls and puts. <laughs> Maybe I'm just not good at timing. I don't know, but I'm good at timing the equity moves. I'm a stock trader. Yeah, right. stock market time. That's why we bring on Nick Shaheen on the Tuesday. He's our options guy. So IBM here beat on the EPS 471 versus 468. Beat on the sales 21.8 versus 21.64 billion dollars. Guidance was strong as well. They see their fiscal year 20 adjusted EPS guidance uh, at uh, around $13.35 or higher, which was a slight beat on the estimate there. So strong numbers. Across the board, at least in the headlines for IBM from last. There's no quarter. growth here. There's no growth. This is just the fact that they didn't lower guidance. It wasn't that bad. Yeah. Expectations were in the gutter for this stock. I mean, it's just been the performance. You think so about how the much. Not that IBM has always been the revenue, uh, just not growing. So last, if we made uh, twenty-one point seven billion dollars last quarter, that was up by like essentially equivalent to where it was on, they don't grow on, on uh 
a year over year basis, right? They so, bought Red Hat to try to address the growing issue, but again, they still it's yeah, very difficult the, for a company the, this the, size. The revenue on a year over year basis has not has not grown for several years now. No, and that's why they get this multiple. Like people are wondering why it trades with a multiple of 10, 11, or twelve, and the market's up at twenty two because they don't have any growth. And then you challenge, you know, whether you know this is going to be even be able to keep up those earnings. I mean, it sounds like in the near foreseeable future they are. It's a dividend play. It's like a bond almost at this point in time. Um, the question is, you know, can they continue to, you know, make thirteen to fourteen dollars, you know, like an AT and T or Verizon, and then continue on for the foreseeable future? Maybe, you know. So if you think of it that way, you know, it's a dividend play. That's why you're in IBM. You're not in it for the growth. You're in it for the dividend. It's getting a lift here this morning. It's a nice lift. But it's, you know, the growth managers coming in saying this is the turnaround story for IBM. They're going to buy up to 150 and 160. Are the analysts coming in with all their upgrades here. I don't think so. It's not a story stock, you know, and the story matters more than anything. Netflix still is a story. Tesla has a hell of a story. What's the IBM story? Watson? We heard Watson 20 years ago, didn't we? How long has Watson been out there? We did not hear 20 years ago. Long time ago. Maybe 10 when years. was Watson on Jeopardy? Like 10 years ago. 10 at least. There's not, you know, they had the little cool story going with the blockchain for a bet that helped the stock and, and suckered me in it for a little while as well. But I tell you, the growth is just not here. The story is not here. The money is elsewhere, in my opinion. And I do. Was it was it Watson that beat uh, Kasparov or was that a different or was that Big Blue? Uh, that was Big Blue. That was Big Blue. Yeah, that was a different computer. Uh, boom. They they popped up. Well, well, says Watson has been around since the 80s. Uh, what? Yeah. Well, first of all, Dennis, what about the Red Hat integration? What about that acquisition of Red Hat? I'm think? not seeing it in the earnings. They're not growing. They paid a big okay. buck for Red Hat, but I don't see huge growth. Maybe it's going to be coming, but you know that's why. That's exactly they're trying to address their growth problem externally by doing acquisitions because they can't grow internally. They haven't been able to grow internally for a long time. So they come in, they buy Red Hat, and saying, "Okay, well, we're going to buy growth." But we, you know, we're not seeing huge growth in the earnings here yet. One forty-seven oh five. That's your pre-market high. Or it actually was an after-hours high. I stand corrected. Uh, now you've pulled back, and someone's trying to hold a bid here. Let's call it right in this area. One forty-four forty. Really, an interesting area because you gap down off earnings uh, last quarter. And you had a gap between basically one one forty one thirty nine and one forty three seventy two, so you're filling that gap. So if that was your target to fill the gap, you're a gap trader, then you know whatever, perhaps take some profits. I'm just saying, I'll give it a little more room. If it holds one forty four, I think you got a chance to you know challenge that one forty seven. I think if you reach 144 that area you start to fall back into the gap area so i think i think it's important to hold 144 off the open and go out and take out that pre-market high and who knows maybe get to 150 it's held up well we'll say this it, you know ibm is notorious for getting a little bit of a lift on their earnings and then, that are okay and then selling it all off it has held up so you had four hours trading last night basically after the report and you've had uh, four and a half hours this morning. So you've had a significant amount, 162,000 shares already traded. So it's holding up. That's the good news. Again, the bad news is I just don't see the analysts coming in and upgrading it here all of a sudden. I don't see this parade, you know, coming to drive this up to 150, 160, et cetera, et cetera. So I just, you know, could it Warren's go up to 145, okay. 148, 150? Yeah, maybe. But I don't think this is the, the big money to be made here in IBM. Just my opinion. Johnson and Johnson. Yeah, this one's quiet here. Essentially in line, the EPS beat by a penny, buck eighty-eight versus a buck eighty-seven. Sales was a slight miss, but it's in line more or less. Twenty point seven five versus twenty point seven eight billion dollars. Uh, so quiet here. In line report. Hmm. You had a spike up to over 151. That was a little bit overdone. Let's see here. Well, it's overdone now. 151.27. And then you came all the way down. This has had a nice range down to one, 146 even. And now you're just kind of consolidating here at 147.30. Let me go to the dailies. And 
got to get back above 148. 148.50 fills the gap from yesterday. 149.27. Look out below 146 because that's where your three and four day low come in that area. Uh, and this is like 146 and then just under 145. You have one, two, three, four lows in a row. So some technical training in Johnson & Johnson. Any any thoughts on that issue? No, guys? he got up over 150. He touched it up there. Last night, you know, they were pumping it a bit on fast money. It was actually trading up over 151 ahead of the report, but that came in. There was options or something. They saw some option trades that thought the report was going to be good. Uh, obviously, that didn't work out. So back down here at 147. Uh, it was, it, it it's had a good run. There's underneath demand for a stock like J&J, so I don't think this one's going to get killed. And we know if they do get killed, it seems like eventually they come back anyways. I mean, case of McDonald's, case in point, remember this? I was like, yep. I think you buy this pullback when it was 195. I never did. And anyways, we made a bet, and it went down to 190, and you got out of that bet. Um, but it's been up. That's, and I mean, the good stocks eventually come back on disappointing reports. McDonald's is just a great stock. Costco, same story. I mean, this was what a move at Costco yeah. yesterday. Yeah, it, and you know what? It had the rating and it was moving. They were the CEO was on Mad Money there last night, so maybe that was the excitement too. Yesterday, Whew. you do see these things run up. You know, it was advertised. As Kramer said in the morning, we're gonna have the CEO on tonight. A lot of times, you do see these things move up during the day when the CEO is gonna be on Fast Money. And by the trading action last night, it looks like there was a lot of people playing for that because it really didn't go up much last night on the Mad Money. It's actually trading flat here right now in an uptape. So a little bit crowded, probably people buying it during the day ahead of the interview there with Mad Money and Jim Kramer. And it's it's hanging out. But I mean, this stock is incredible. The company, the company, not so much the stock is incredible, the company is incredible. So yeah. I was saying after that last report, when it was trading at two ninety nine, two, I said it should be up 10, 15 bucks on this report. The report was incredible. A 9% comp. Rate. It was comp. Yeah. Yep. yep. And it's finally starting to catch up here. I mean, this, this stock, this company is just running on all cylinders all the time. It's got to be. And, you know, you think of Amazon, you know, maybe one of the best retailers out there. You got to put Costco right near the top. They just perform 9% comps. That was blow, blew me away. And the hot dogs for a dollar and the onion grinder. You got you can't leave that out on all the free samples. Uh, how about someone's asking here about cough capital one financial earnings last night. Yeah. Good, good commercials. With, is that Jennifer Garner that does that? Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> uh, the earnings were, were good. They beat on the EPS to uh, $2 49 cents for a $2 cent estimate beat on the sales as well. 7.4 billion for seven point three four billion so this one's also a little bit sleepy but the earnings were good nice nice pop you start to look and you think okay what's going to happen on 105 because 105 70 was a high back on the 16th it kind of this isn't a stock that typically moves seven eight ten bucks that's up 250 i don't know what the straddle was paying but i would think you've probably run into a little bit of initial resistance not 105 area uh, you did, uh, if you were using that level in the after hours trading, you would have caught a good trade as it ticked 106 even and it's pulled back. So, all time high, I believe, is uh, that 105.70. So, no, 106 and a half. Oh, I stand corrected. Back in January of 2008, that's two bucks away if you're looking for the all time high and cough. Uh, Man, you've had a couple ticks down to 103. They were just really quick briefs. So I'd use that as minor intraday support here for COF Capital One Financial. Let's talk about Boeing here. Uh, Joel, you pondered out loud, or, or I think you maybe, maybe said it uh, con convincingly, that yesterday would be the day Boeing would break 320. Well, Correct. I think you maybe thought it would happen on the initial headline yep. uh, that they're looking to borrow money. It did not happen then, but it did happen later in the day when Boeing confirmed reports that at the earliest, the 737 MAX will not be ungrounded until halfway through the year. They are, you know, the timeline on this, they have no idea. They're just keep pushing it back and they're not borrowing $10 billion because they're getting this plane flying next year. So the writing was on the wall. When they needed to borrow money, it means the max is not flying anytime soon. Because as soon as the max is back in the air and they start selling these planes again, they're cash flow positive. 
it's all about the max and it's all about how long it takes and they're burning a lot of cash every single day that this plane is not in the air so if it takes longer than six months nine months they're going to continue to burn cash they're going to need to raise more money so it's all about the timeline on how long it takes to get this plane back into the air which is a complete unknown not only to us but an unknown to boeing as well so hard stock to call a bottom in for the simple reason is that nobody knows it was weird. They there. popped it up off the open, right? They got the boat fully loaded. They smashed it through 320, right? Yeah. And then and then they take it down to 306, and then they halt it. I mean, we had already seen the news. So they halt it, news pending. They come out with the news that was already late down the street, and then they rally it off the numbers. So, man, oh, man, that was a tricky one to play. Uh, now that 320, that's going to be your major resistance on the upside here. Uh, anyone that caught that, I believe yesterday's low was 306. But you got to think, man, this thing might have a date with uh, with 300 pretty soon. Yeah, you've come this far. I mean, and there's the, the pure okay. play, if you're looking at plays off of this, is Spirit Aerosystems, SPR. And look at what the stock has done. This is one of the major parts of Flyers for the Max. And it's $90 back in November. Obviously, you know, that's when Boeing was up at 370 And it's been hit harder than Boeing, a lot harder than Boeing. So, you know, I think Boeing is in bad shape. This is Spirit Aerosystems is in really bad shape because the longer this plane takes in the air, not good for for them for the either. supplier i don't know and, where uh, else to sell parts i'm not sure what the oh i'm sorry flow situation but this yep. is a direct play off of boeing SDR. and i i did look at uh airbus it has a really long symbol but uh airbus is airbus has been doing pretty good if you're looking for uh you know if you don't want to short the ibm but who knows how many planes they can make but we're a minute late for our guest here spencer yeah, uh, that's that's okay i'm bringing him on right now we are joined today by jerry parker as i mentioned at the top of the show he is the chairman and ceo of chesapeake capital and one of the uh, turtle traders, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Jerry, uh, good morning. Good morning. How are we doing this morning, Jerry? Doing well, doing well. Jerry, th thanks for coming on here. I really appreciate it. Uh, I just wanted to run one statement that uh, was made on uh, yesterday's CNBC show by uh, Paul Tudor Jones. Uh, and I know you've been trading as long, if not longer than Mr. Tudor Jones. And he said, this is a crazy run. And it's like the 1999 like market. Now you have experience from them. Uh, my co-host Dennis uh, refuted it in some ways. Uh, what's your reaction to that kind of statement? Yeah, I picked up on some negative vibes on Twitter this morning as well. Um, people thinking uh, there's a lot of big differences. I think uh, if you read it carefully, he sort of says it's kind of like it, not that it is. And that uh, we have a ways to go before it gets, you know, fully, um, uh, played out to where we should be really, really nervous. And so uh, not quite there yet, but I guess it just kind of reminds him of that. That's what old people do. You know, they, like me, I'm in my sixties as well. So we always look back and harken back to the old days, try to bring back some memories. Okay. All right. So uh, just real quick, you were one of the original turtles of uh, Richard Dennis uh, working in the turtle program. Um, several years since you've been been on your own how much of the original uh turtle mechanics or turtle programming do you use in your trading now oh a lot more than you would uh imagine you know i think um the money management uh, rules and sizing your position and creating a portfolio how to stay out of trouble the 10 commandments of systematic trend following they're all still in place the biggest uh, changes have just been um adding more markets. You know, I probably traded with 25 markets in 1984, and now it's a lot more, 100 markets maybe, a few more commodities, a lot of um, bond markets, of course. And uh, we added single stocks, and we got away from trading the indices. So, I mean, there's hundreds, thousands of those to choose from. And um, the biggest um, change in the system itself is uh, longer term in nature. The shorter term systems that we used to use uh, with massive leverage, I lost 60% in one day once. Um, you know, those don't work anymore. And that sort of leverage, of course, is not really tolerable with longer term systems. 
let, let's talk about the single stock futures here. I noticed you have a positions in a few stocks. I mean, are you are you doing the stock futures like is a hedge? Are you going in for the long term premium? What's the liquidity like, and what do you think the future is for single stock futures? I trade both uh, the single stock futures and the cash, and um, so you can get uh, leverage about the same kind of leverage on either. So um, I use it as just a diversifying tool as. Um, so my goal would be to create a portfolio of crazy stocks that are not, they don't look like the S and P, uh, WWE, Weight Watchers, Tesla, Canopy Growth. Uh, so I just build the portfolio strictly based on diversification and not so much on historical performance or, you know, obviously what I predict is going to happen in the future, which I don't predict what's going to happen in the future. And it's all, you know, the same type of trend following that I do on the, currencies and, com- and commodities. And you're you're going long and short to single stock futures? That's right. Long and short. Um, hard to find many shorts these days. And uh, when we did uh, when we did our test call um, uh, last week, I kind of I had a kind of tongue in cheek. I said, when are your model? What are the what is the top according to your models here? And uh, you just kind of shrugged here. So um, you know, just based on your your market experience, what's going on geopolitically? I mean, you know, you you have a very very strong trend here. You've seen strong trends in commodity markets. You've seen reversals in trends. You know, what fundamentally or technically, you know, should people looking for for a turn in this market? Well, I've seen uh, a lot of strong trends and I've seen them end very violently and abruptly. Uh, so I don't think that the trend or the, how strong the trend is portends good or bad things for the future. You know, things can happen um, that you can't predict, of course. Um, so from a trend following point of view, I think uh, all I really ever make a bet on is, you know, what's the right position? And the right position now is to be in stocks and in an uptrend and the market in general is in an uptrend. But if I had to um, put together a, an idea of uh, trying to figure out when it might all end, I think it's just going to pretty much uh, revolve around excess, you know, uh, optimism. And so I think Jones is onto it. You know, if if we just get too much optimism and we see those signs, um, the headline in Barron's this week was thirty thousand, and uh, you know, numbers like that, specific numbers that people are predicting. Uh, you know, when you get into a taxi or an Uber. Your driver tells you he's long equities. He tells you which ones they can't go down. Little signals like that, where um, from uh, you know the most elementary sources, uh, you're seeing way too much bullishness. Combined with maybe uh, you know fundamentals kind of coming out saying uh, bullish, bullish, and the market kind of sells off. So I think in that environment of way too much optimism, you can have a trigger mechanism, which would be something like a fundamental report. Uh, some earnings or uh, unemployment that says, hey, we should be going higher, but the trend sort of <clears throat> uh, peters out a little bit and starts going lower, and that could be a kind of a, a typical sign of uh, the market saying one thing and the news saying something else. And that's kind of where you want to be, I think, when you're predicting uh, turnarounds. Ron with Jerry Parker. He is the chairman and CEO of Chesapeake Capital. Uh, Jerry, I, I just want to get your thoughts here on how we can think about this market after the great year we had last year we've continued to just march higher and march higher and march higher in spite of any number of uh headlines that that would seem to halt that momentum and and haven't how how do you think about this market right now and in 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 the context of last year's returns and, and and this year's returns i probably don't take that into consideration you know I think um, being a systematic trader and having rules and having a plan and a process in place is so important. And a lot of these stocks or, you know, uh, these trends, palladium, you know, I trade a lot of commodities. So palladium is in the news a lot. It's skyrocketing, you know, every day like Tesla. And so I look at it in terms of, thankfully, I got in months and months ago when my process and system and rules told me to. So I'm not um, worried about it today. I'm sitting here with big profits, or if I have uh, a stock that I bought recently without a big profit, I have a stop loss. You know, I'm not gonna lose much money. So I think with 
following your system and getting in when you're supposed to, and then being able to endure this type of trend, and which seems excessive, and everyone's telling you that the market shouldn't be this high, it, you know, if you have a profit, you're golden, and you're not worried too much because you're giving back profits. And then if you trade with stop losses, which I think is mandatory, taking small losses, then you can just step in and take a trade um, that fits in with your system and your money management and not risk too much and then sleep at night. So I think with the proper tools and rules, you can ignore all of the talk about how wrong you are. And yet, uh, you know, what's really been wrong for so long is uh, the people going against the stock trend. That's sort of typical. We're on the line with Jerry Parker from Chesapeake Capital. I'll throw a little curveball at you here. Bitcoin. Have you been uh, the futures? Now, what I've noticed uh, as of late, you know, the uh, CBO dropped their contract. The Merck kept theirs going. Uh, it's had, you know, a decent run here. Uh, do you have any fundamental or technical comments on Bitcoin? Well, I love Bitcoin. And so I, as soon as it got liquid, the futures got liquid, I added it to my portfolio. And it's the perfect add because, you know, uh, it's, different to say the least. And I don't think many people even know what it is. I certainly don't. It moves differently. So A plus for being able to add it to your, your systematic trend portfolio, because that's what we want, just different things that, that behave differently. So I bought it last year when it uh, started making that first breakout up and then I took a loss on it. So it kind of is just sitting there, um, maybe a potential short, but sort of sitting in consolidation right now. And I think in some ways, from my perspective, it's the perfect market because of the more you can kind of convince yourself you really don't know what's going to happen, uh, you're more likely to follow your system and your trends and be happy with that. And so, you know, Bitcoin is the prime example of no one really knowing what the heck is driving the price and what's going on with it. And you have no clue, unlike some of these other markets where we think we're kind of experts and we may override or supplement the trend following with our knowledge in the Bitcoin, you're just helpless unless you just follow the trends. Uh, Jerry, I'm wondering, you, you mentioned palladium, uh, not the only commodity that's been hot of late. We've seen rallies in, in, in copper, uh, oil has been volatile. So which, which are on your radar right now? Yeah, I think this is a really good time. It's <clears throat> probably one of the best uh, commodity rallies or, you know, seeing strength across all these markets uh, for the first time in a long time. So I'm pretty psyched about it. Kind of sick and tired of being short all the grains and metals and energy. So um, getting some of these rallies, uh, and, you know, let's look at wheat it is very strong uh, compared to the other grains. Uh, silver, gold, and platinum, I think are still hanging in there in, in the uptrend. So it's worth keeping your position there. Uh, recent breakouts in high prices in cotton in the softs, cotton, uh, coffee had a, made a nice run. It's pulled back a lot, but uh, last week, super strong in cocoa and um, sugar. And um, I think cattle looks like it might take off as well. So it's been a while since I've been able to string out a, lot, a long list of markets and the commodities. And you mentioned copper, <clears throat> that's uh, looking pretty good, I guess. And uh, so it's really nice, especially for someone like me who trades about 35% of the portfolio is gonna be commodities. And um, you know, whenever you hear traders or especially uh, trend traders have to talk about the short positions, you know there's not a lot going on. The longs historically have just made so much more and we just need to have some of these mega trends take off so we don't you know, keep lagging behind this uh, S&P trend. Jerry, uh, just one final thing for you. I, you were never on the floor, right? You were always an upstairs trader. Did That's you right. ever? Okay. Uh, just, you know, real quickly for our listeners, I mean, that, you know, many probably haven't heard of, uh, you know, Richard Dennis, C&D commodities and whatnot, but is there, you mentioned that one big trade, you know, that, that trade where you had a big loser. Is there, is there something, you know, a trade or a moment or something, you know, over the years that, you know, really, you know, sticks out in your mind and has uh, shaped your investing and trading philosophy? Well, yeah, I could give you a couple of good ideas that I ask uh, <clears throat> Rich about, you know, in between the sessions of our class. Um, I asked him, you know, what's the biggest mistake we're going to make? 
and he said, um, you know, not getting back in. You know, it's great to trade with stop losses and trend um, moving averages and breakouts, but sometimes when you get out, for whatever reason, the market goes right back to the highs and you have to get back in because it could keep going for a long way. And I think that's uh, the mo one of the most important things to remember. The palladium is sold off and, and uh, looked like it was, uh, the trend was over only to go right back up to the highs and have a nice sustained run again. And uh, then the two, two most important rules, I think in trading are trade small, don't trade, don't use too much leverage and follow your system, follow your rules all the time and I'd say that all the money that I didn't make in my life is due to those, is to violating those two rules. Certainly nothing more important than um, not getting out of a trade until your exit is, your predetermined exit, your rules are hit. Um, you know, as humans, we just get too nervous and too worried about giving back profit. When, when we have these profits, we should be more bold about uh, hanging in there. So it, all goes, to, yeah. uh, it all goes back to plan your trade, trade your plan. Jerry Parker exactly. is the chairman and CEO of Chesapeake Capital. Jerry, thank you so much for the time today and have a good rest of your day. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks, Jerry. We'll get you back on again soon. Uh, S&P futures, basically where we were at when we started the show. Uh, still up 13 handles at 33, 20. <laughs> Three three two two five is getting hard with all the handles here, uh, but trading up twelve seventy five pre market high still stands at thirty six fifty. Uh, Spencer, do we have any uh, any more earnings to cover? I, I mean, there are a couple. Uh, nothing that 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 is super uh, interesting to me. Uh, I mean, we've got uh, Interactive Brokers, Abbott Labs. Uh, BKR. I do want to talk since I mentioned off the top and we haven't hit it yet. Is just this, the rallying SPCE here. SPCE here is yeah. just <clears throat> never ending. Like yeah, that, never ending. Again, trying to call top, you know. And it even looked like it even looked like you had a triple top going on there at sixteen. So maybe this is it. And then just boom, yesterday just takes out again. Very, very, very difficult to call tops. I mean, the breakouts, and we've talked about, you know, from 2018, 2019, breakouts were not working. Breakouts are working in 2020. They have been working for the last month. When the stock breaks out, it's, you know, you can look even on this SPCE, get all the consolidation at the end of December and early January, just under 12 bucks. We broke out through 12. If you were playing that breakout, you took almost zero heat. And then again at $16 consolidation station, playing the breakout and the stock 17 and over 18. Um, I mean, breakouts are working. Here's one for you. Uh, I just grabbed this from the chat. I, I'm sorry, I, I actually missed who said this. The chat really is flying here today. There's a lot of messages in there, but somebody was mentioning Shaq, S-H-A-K. I'm trying to go back and yeah, Mitch. Mitch, um, he's saying that there's potential to squeeze him here in Shaq too. You know what, Mitch, I see it as well. I see what oh. you're looking at. S-H-A-K, above 71. See these three tops? 71, 72, 71, 78, 71, 17. Let's call it 72 bucks. This thing starts trading over 72, and you're into a gap, and you could squeeze them for a bit there. So that's interesting. I mean, again, you know, anticipating the breakout, that doesn't always work. You know, when you're playing breakouts, you're going to wait till they're breaking out. So above 72, this gets interesting. So, Mitch, thanks for bringing that to my attention. I wrote it down on my sheet. Above 72, interesting in Shaq. All right, yeah, that's uh, that's kind of formations we like here. The 71, 72 was the high, two day high, 71, 78, call it $72. So we'll see it and just quiet on the downside, too. Uh, pair of lows, and if you're trying to pick it up on the cheap here, or maybe if you want to use a stop, if you're buying the breakout, pair of lows just at 69. So maybe give yourself a little bit of room if you're doing the trade, but uh, do see a double bottom there inside day in Shake Shack. I know uh, Spinner's been talking about this one for it, It's a similar, while. you know, and, and I'm not in it, but it looks good. Above 72, I might get in this. Uh, BYND, it's similar to what we saw for the three days. I mean, it's di different in that regard, but we had the th inside days. And what I said on the Beyond Meet, I said, go with the winner. This thing starts trading above 115.25, it could start squeezing them again. And we saw, you know, now Beyond Meet's in full squeeze mode here again. Um, this is similar situation. You know, if it starts to break down through that double bomb you're talking about, Joel, then it gets a little dicey. Yep. But you get it above 72, 
you know, so inside days are nice to trade. And what Joel means by an inside day is that, that the high and the low from yet the yesterday's trade is inside of the previous day's high and low. So if it can take off and take out those highs, then you start to get a little bit of air above. If it takes out the lows below, then you start to think, okay, well, maybe it's, you know, going to retrace a little bit here. So inside days are nice setups. Uh, going back to this uh, uh, Virgin Galactic space flight company with the Virgin Group developing commercial it's airspace gone, yeah. to go to, the, I don't know. I mean, a lot of, a lot of y'all signing up to go to the moon. But, but, but think about what we talk about on the show a lot. You know, even story. if you're not a fan, story. is this not a story? Is this not a good story? Sounds like you just you just said sign up to go to the moon, sign up to go to space. It sounds like a pretty good story. You're not what going, do we say? Not going to all a yet. good story. You're not going to the moon just yet. They not to the moon. They, <laughs> they, they will take you to the outer space. Yeah, the edge of space. We priced it out on the show, wasn't it? Like two hundred fifty grand. Yeah, something like that. Oh. This is fun. I, you know what? Maybe no. later on in life. Maybe this is something. I don't think I'd be able to handle a rocket ship. I'd probably throw my back out on the thing. I almost threw my back out on that Tesla car. But, um, you know, SPC, I mean, it's it's got a story. So why? Why try to be a hero and call the top? Because you could have been trying this all the way up. Maybe it's overbought. For sure it's overbought. You can see that. But what we said earlier, stocks stay overbought a long time sometimes. This could go 20, could go 22. Who knows where the top is? I don't know where the top is. I've lost a lot of money trying to call tops. I'm not going to try to call on the show. That's probably your most common thing that you say. But that- I've tried. And you know what? Then I try to do it. I got it. Like I'm reiterating myself. Stop trying to call tops. I look at this. I was like, your natural human tendency says, oh, this thing can't stay this high. I want to sell it or I want to sell it short. Well, the natural human tendency, everybody else is a natural human tendency too, and they're getting burned. So. I mean, is there a much short interest on this, Spencer? Do we know? I don't even know if the borrow is that easy. Um, let me look, actually. I don't know if I can. I'm up. just curious if I can even get a borrow on this. I don't know if. Uh, you know what? Because it, it's still, it's a it's a new. No, this, the borrow is not easy. It's a, like, it, it's, a, it's a new symbol because they. Yeah, and the borrow is not easy either. So you have, when you have situations where you can't get a borrow, then you don't even have any shorts keeping the price down. So maybe you have a few people I'm that are sure paying extreme is, prices yeah. for it, but it makes it harder. You know, when stocks become hard to locate, that makes them even more susceptible, not even to a squeeze, but just to excessive, you know, irrational exuberance, if you want to call forward from Alan Greenspan. Um, <laughs> there's no, no shorts to keep the price in check. So, you know, and, and the shorts that are in there are probably paying nosebleed to try to short the thing. So it's difficult. Tough game, I, short I, rocket ships. You All know right. what, De- Dennis? I, I'll let you do it, Spencer. But I just, Dennis, this fits in with your whole like you loved Star Wars and stuff. Maybe you can go, <laughs> you can go and see Darth Vader up Maybe there. Maybe I should buy this stock. <laughs> you, I'll tell you, a... I'm not buying a stock at 1867 was 10 bucks a week and a half ago or two weeks ago. I don't you... chase. Okay. Two All things right, Dennis, I don't like doing: short rocket ships and chasing. So this is just like a no touch for me. Uh, it's a fun story to talk about on the show. It's fun to watch and see what happens here, but. I tried chase Beyond Meat overnight. Look what happened. And I thought, oh, yeah, Tesla squeeze and Beyond Meat will squeeze. Now it's already come back, but I shook out. So, you know why? Because I take losses. And the thing starts going down two, three bucks. I was like, well, it's not responding the way I want it to respond. I want to see immediate gratification. I want to see this thing start going up following the Tesla lead. It's coming back here now, and it's trying to do it. So if I would have held on, I'd probably get my money back. But I'm not in the business of holding on to losers, hoping they come back. I'm in the business of cutting those losers when the trade's not working in my favor. And All right, Spencer. Overnight what, trade. My reason was case, I thought it'd be up overnight. And in this case, he means shorting a literal rocket ship company. But yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Joel will address <laughs> Joel will address tickers in the chat uh, at, at nine. I do want to do some quick, quick market structure stuff real fast. So there's some news yesterday from the SEC. They're changing the way the closing auctions. Uh, work essentially or, or the way you can trade them. So last year, about 7% of all trading volume in the U.S. took place on the closing auction. Uh, and there's now there's going to be this new option, this new avenue where you can essentially uh, go around the exchanges, NASDAQ and NYSE, and go to CBO. CBOE is going to have their own uh, closing auction process that will uh, allow anyone who's submitting a market order at the closing auction to essentially avoid paying the exchange fees uh, for NASDAQ and NYSE and go through, go through CBO instead. CBO is going to, they're going to match the, the, the closing auction from NYSE and NASDAQ. Yeah. 
So and, they're not going to have their own auction. They're just going to match the price right. of the NASDAQ and New York Stock Exchange closing auction. They proposed this, and I'm going from my memory here a little ago. bit. This was proposed a few years ago, yeah. and it was originally, I think, accepted by the SEC and then appealed by the NASDAQ and NYSC for the reason that they're saying, hey, they're free riding off of our whole auction process. Yes. Good argument. Good argument. I kind of tend to agree that it's free riding. I've argued the same thing, you know, the same thing with the exchange market makers that match our bids and offers all the time free riding off our quotes. I throw my bid out there and I don't get filled because of somebody else that's willing, you know, to that has the ability to just match my quote. It doesn't really seem that fair. So I kind of tend to side with the NASDAQ and New York Stock Exchange. Obviously, the SEC does not side with them because they just approved it. So now you have, you know, a situation where you could have in the argument, you know, against this other arguments against this besides the whole free riding thing could be the integrity of the quote. I mean, if you have, you know, the process, you know, uh, so, so only a certain amount of people participate in the auction, they can go just match it over at CBOE. Um, maybe you have the potential to try to manipulate the price on the NYSE and NASDAQ, especially if there's less participants there because they're doing matching over at CBOE. And, you know, and obviously it could be more susceptible to manipulation. There is an argument there. I don't think this is going to get much, I don't think there's a lot of people, like I would be uncomfortable going and sending my uh, my order over to CBOE because I've always done it on NYSE and NASDAQ, my clothes. So I don't think you're going to see everybody just all of a sudden, you know, jumping over to save the fees over there. Maybe a few traders do it. Um, I'm probably going to stick with the NYSE and NASDAQ. I don't think they're going to get a, like, I don't think you're going to see all of a sudden half the volume switch over the closing volume to CBOE. I just don't see that happening. You know, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think there's going to be that much volume going over there. Hey, Sp- okay, that's uh, some market starting. Spencer, could you could just uh, give the uh, the lift news real quickly? Oh, I just closed it out. You want me to get it back? Oh, oh, oh man. I, 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 I'll get it back. I don't think this is the reason why. Uh, you guys seem convinced that this is the reason why Lyft is trading uh, higher this morning. Well, it's not really up at all. Well, we didn't yeah. say that. Well, you're right. So it's yeah. up 35 cents. I mean, the markets, the market effects okay, are more fine, than anything. Fine. But... Well, the the news uh, that was that they partnered with LeBron James to uh, to provide free. LeBron James. LeBron James. <laughs> LeBron James. <laughs> All right. Happy. Happy now. Thank you. Spencer, Joel doesn't want to play that. I just, I, uh, are we going to get Joel for playing that too? We always get Joel for playing that. Oh, yeah. Are we going to get Joel? That kid's going to sue We'll get written up for that. I, I, yeah. closed, I closed out the tab like a minute ago and I was like, I, I, I wonder if he's going to ask me to play it. And then he did. Play it one more time. <laughs> what? LeBron James. LeBron James. <laughs> All right. LeBron James. All right. Now we're getting. Lyft's got Lyft signs up with LeBron James. <laughs> yeah. 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 That, that's the Lyft news today. All right. Joel, you have, I think, hopefully, been Wait, writing down you, some tickers. Yes, I have. Have let's, you? Let's, uh, take a crack. let's start with Lyft here, but we'll, we'll take a crack at a few of them. Okay. All right. Are you get a man to control? I, I gotta so hop off. I yeah. gotta Bye, go. Dennis. Gotta, yeah, I'll talk I to you a little bit. It's on the go. So we'll let you Joel do some ticker time. All right. Okay. So you're gonna okay. So I'm I'm gotcha. not assuming all right, I'm not assuming control here. So let me go back to my other layout that I use mostly when I'm on the show here. And we are looking just real quick, technicals in lift. Let me I change my charts around here. Just pause. With if, if you want to grab control, you can grab control and then we can. Uh, that's all right. You, all you, right. I didn't know if you were going to stay on, but if you're staying on, that's yeah, great. Okay. Uh, Lyft, mm, man, I'll tell you, longer term, you're trading up 41 cents here uh, at 50 bucks. I mean, I, I think I think there's some room up to 50 here. A breakout of 50 would be a clear move higher. Monthly resistance at 52 not 52 at 50 also. Um, also, this thing just hasn't done a, a real good retracement yet. Uh, that IPO high at 88.60. And how low did you get? Let's call it 40. Let's call it 44.22. I think, you know, longer term here, you know, maybe this thing gets half of this back, goes to 60.62. And, uh, you know, if they can get things, stop losing money. And uh, Uber's been on a nice run, too. The only stock that uh, Nick Shaheen has bought for his son. He's been holding on to that one, wrote some puts. So those are moving up nicely. Uh, what about the uh, the day where they um, uh, uh, the lockup ended? That might have been the, the exact low of the move in that one. Uh, I see we, we really uh, have, uh, ignored NIO this week. And this thing has been 
just taken off too. Trading up in the pre market. Fundamentals aside, I don't know what's your pre pre market high here at five forty seven. Just bumping up. Maybe have a little seller here, but about above five fifty. Things open up here on the monthly charts. You're looking for a monthly target. Hmm. I don't know. You get into a big gap there, a real wide open area when it was on um on a uh, sixty minutes. Yeah. So. Right. Okay. Um, let's see. Did we cover both? We talked in Boeing. Uh, I would just, if you're trading this Boeing, keep an eye on yesterday's low. I know it's trading lower here in the market. Netflix, I don't know what they're saying on their conference call here. Down 428 though. Uh, keep an eye on 305.75. That was the low yesterday before the halt. You tried to rally. 320 is your major resistance now. Uh, based on the monthly charts, this is monthly chart only mm, after you've gotten through that low from January of 2019, boy, you're talking working into 292.47. So call 292.50, your next monthly support here in Boeing. So I covered NIO. If you see any other ones happening here when I'm talking, Spencer, just let me know. Uh, someone asked about pot stocks. And haven't talked about them as much lately. Uh, let's look at the big dog. CGC, uh, Bank America, nailed the bottom in this one. Uh, I know it was around 15, 16 bucks when they came out with the buy. Uh, got the 25, let's call it 25 and a half. Because I'm looking, I see three highs in a row. Ah, man, 26. I'm going to bump it up to 26 for the next leg higher. 25.97 high, 25.89 high, 25.64 uh, high from yesterday. So you're developing some major resistance. Take a look in your New York open book to see if there's a big old seller there at, uh, at uh, $26. Maybe people stepping ahead of it, uh, trading up 30 cents, kind of a quiet session. So if you do a go to retreat CGC support yesterday's uh, the close from yesterday, 2415 uh, till Ray played this one a little bit. I, anything just, it just moves too much in a day. You look at it, it's up two bucks and it's down a buck, but quiet consolidation here. Uh, hmm, 20 bucks, 2011 is your two day low. You're well above that. Got way up to twenty two ninety five yesterday, so that's a, a buck fifty away. Use that as a target, and then um, APHA. I know I've been talking about that five fifty level forever. Snuck through it a little bit yesterday, went to five sixty three, but couldn't close above five fifty. So I'm looking for a close above 550 to confirm another leg higher. KP asked me if I'm still holding Twitter. I am still holding Twitter in the long-term investment account, but I have not done any short-term trading on it. Kind of wish I could, I would. Um, potential breakout here in this one. Look at that. Three highs in a row, 34.27, 34.39, 34.39. Getting a running start in it today. So there's a potential breakout if you're so inclined to play it that way. Gap to fill up to 37.78. So we'll see if we fill uh, that gap ahead of earnings. AMD over 50 bucks. Uh, boom. 51.81. Yesterday's high. That's really the only target you have on the upside. Uh, $52 psychological level, man, this thing is doubled since November. So pick your targets on this one right now. The only resistance in sight is 5181. If it starts to, you know, uh, it's posted new high closes of the move in what four of the last five, five of the last six sessions. So when it's not, you know, keep an eye on the closing high of the move instead of trying to pick, you know, a top or a bottom here. Uh, are you seeing anything on Netflix here besides we talking about the resistance in it? Is there anything uh, you seeing anything going on that one? Uh, their call might be going on right now, but I don't I don't see anything in terms. Okay. of. Okay, um, let's go. Oh, let's no, switch no, over for you guys that don't know. Netflix, we have a couple oh. different chats here. We have the YouTube chat, and then we have the pre market Benzinga chat. Uh, I think some people are in both. Uh, but uh, let's go to the 
uh, premarket.benzinga, uh, IBKR, uh, that reported earnings today. Do you have that report, Spencer? Uh, yeah, let me pull it up. I have it here, and I have everything in the Benzinga Pro. <laughs> so the earnings from yesterday, EPS missed 58 for 61 cents. Sales missed 503 versus $504 million. Uh, nice rally up here. Um, spike down. I just keep it. We are trading in the red here. So on a red day with a stock with earnings, first you want to see if it can fill the gap at 49.91 and kind of trading in that area, kind of light trading here. Uh, but keeping an eye on that close here, 50.83. Um, that's going to be your major resistance. That was a high close of the move. So that's your major resistance. Uh, important area to hold right here. Where are we trading at? Oh, man, that, that might have been an odd lot there. Uh, boom, boom. Let me see. The last trade's at 49 even. Kind of small shares trading at 49, but huh, pair of lows. At, mm, you're breaking down here. 48.96, that was your three-day low. I'm looking for 48.10 after this one, but uh, can't gleam a lot here from the free market trading. Uh, Lex Xander's asking about Walmart. Has this stopped going down yet? Mm, yeah, it stopped going down. Have a you have a bottom here, a potential bottom. Someone lo loves this thing at one fourteen fifty. Uh, you have three out of your last four lows in that area. Similar, not much on the upside. I'd say you know stop stop going down here. You found a buyer at one fourteen fifty. Looks like our Walmart uh, could perhaps turn up here. Someone's asking about Costco and holy mackerel. That was the third upgrade to the stock since April of 2018. And man, oh man, I don't know if they caught the shorts on this thing, but the stock had an $11 range in all of December. It was up seven, eight bucks yesterday. Trading up today at 313.53. <sighs> Keep an eye, high close of the move, 313.36. Uh, if you have a target anywhere, 315, 320, take it if it's your target. If not, man, you can comfortably move your stop up maybe until it gets back into that gap area. And it's only a small gap from yesterday, uh, 0530 to 0576. So an historical move here in Costco. Uh, what else do we have here? ISRG and uh, not full disclosure, not great with five, six hundred dollar stocks. Um, hmm, let's see, are we at an all time high in this one? Yeah, 605.49. I guess that's all I, the only thing I can give you. Uh, that's your four day high. Um, ahead of that, uh, 603.12. January 13th close, that's your all-time closing high. You're trading above that right now. I don't know if it's any volume or any news, but uh, potential target hit here for ISRG. Nope, all-time high is higher than that. 618, 618.56. So in no man's land on that one. And what else? Um See if there's anything else I wrote down. Uh, and, uh, Amazon, once again, hard stock, uh, you know, big spreads, but nice steady uh, rise up here going with the market. Kind of been marching on the monthlies, marching higher. Uh, can't really tell too much on the dailies. I'll just tell you there's a couple pesky highs. Let's call it 1915 resistance. Uh, you had three highs between 1909 and 1917. So split those as potential resistance here in Amazon. And uh, WRTC, I, don't, I hope this is not a penny stock. I've never looked at this one. Nice move yesterday, follow through. Don't know what the news, don't know what the story is. Uh, quietly sitting here at uh, 713. Real quiet holding bid here. So uh, this one on the monthlies, if you're looking for monthly resistance uh, back in May of last year, if you're looking for a potential target, uh, you had a high at seven, eight bucks. Eight bucks was your high back from April of 2019. So there we go. And 
I think we covered everything. I think I it's a good you... place, to, good place to wrap it up. Yeah. Uh, yep. Always catch uh, our full show on our YouTube channel or on our podcast, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify. Tune in. Give us a call seven three four four nine four zero two four six. Leave us a voicemail, and we will ask your question on the air. I want to thank our guest today, Jerry Parker. Thanks to all of you in our chats. Please remember all the information from our show meant to be used as informational purposes only and not for investing or trading advice. Everyone have a great rest of your day. We'll be back with you tomorrow.